Greetings esteemed viewers, and welcome to Tailingo, the channel dedicated to enhancing your English language proficiency through the art of storytelling. You'll learn English through story. Tailingo was created with the aim of making English learning both highly effective and enjoyable. If you're looking to reach the peak of English proficiency through entertaining stories and novels, don't forget to subscribe Tailingo and press bell icon. King Grizzly Beard A great king of a land far away in the east had a daughter who was very beautiful, but so proud, and haughty, and conceited, that none of the princes who came to ask her in marriage was good enough for her, and she only made sport of them. Once upon a time the king held a great feast, and asked thither all her suitors, and they all sat in a row, ranged according to their rank, kings, and princes, and dukes, and earls, and counts, and barons, and knights. Then the princess came in, and as she passed by them she had something spiteful to say to everyone. The first was too fat, he's as round as a tub, said she. The next was too tall, what a maple, said she. The next was too short, what a dumpling, said she. The fourth was too pale, and she called him Wallface. The fifth was too red, so she called him Coxcomb. The sixth was not straight enough, so she said he was like a green stick that had been laid to dry over a baker's oven. And thus she had some joke to crack upon everyone, but she laughed more than all at a good king who was there. Look at him, said she, his beard is like an old mop, he shall be called Grizzly Beard. So the king got the nickname of Grizzly Beard. But the old king was very angry when he saw how his daughter behaved, and how she ill-treated all his guests, and he vowed that, willing or unwilling, she should marry the first man, be he prince or beggar, that came to the door. Two days after there came by a traveling fiddler, who began to play under the window and beg alms, and when the king heard him, he said, Let him come in. So they brought in a dirty-looking fellow and when he had sung before the king and the princess, he begged a boon. Then the king said, You have sung so well, that I will give you my daughter for your wife. The princess begged and prayed, but the king said, I have sworn to give you to the first comer, and I will keep my word. So words and tears were of no avail. The parson was sent for, and she was married to the fiddler. When this was over, the king said, Now get ready to go. You must not stay here. You must travel on with your husband. Then the fiddler went his way, and took her with him, and they soon came to a great wood. Pray, said she, whose is this wood? It belongs to King Grizzly Beard, answered he. Hadst thou taken him, all had been thine. Ah, unlucky wretch that I am, sighed she, would that I had married King Grizzly Beard. Next they came to some fine meadows. Whose are these beautiful green meadows, said she. They belong to King Grizzly Beard, hadst thou taken him they had all been thine. Ah, unlucky wretch that I am, said she, would that I had married King Grizzly Beard. Then they came to a great city. Whose is this noble city, said she? It belongs to King Grizzly Beard. Hadst thou taken him, it had all been thine. Ah, wretch that I am, sighed she, why did I not marry King Grizzly Beard? That is no business of mine, said the fiddler. Why should you wish for another husband? I am not I good enough for you. At last they came to a small cottage. What a paltry place, said she. To whom does that little dirty hole belong? Then the fiddler said, That is your and my house, where we are to live. Where are your servants? cried she. What do we want with servants? said he. You must do for yourself whatever is to be done. Now make the fire, and put on water and cook my supper, for I am very tired. But the princess knew nothing of making fires and cooking, and the fiddler was forced to help her. When they had eaten a very scanty meal they went to bed, but the fiddler called her up very early in the morning to clean the house. Thus they lived for two days, and when they had eaten up all there was in the cottage, the man said, Wife, we can't go on thus, spending money and earning nothing. You must learn to weave baskets. Then he went out and cut willows, and brought them home and she began to weave, but it made her fingers very sore. I see this work won't do, said he, try and spin, perhaps you will do that better. 
So she sat down and tried to spin, but the threads cut her tender fingers till the blood ran. See now, said the fiddler, you are good for nothing. You can do no work. What a bargain I have got. However, I'll try and set up a trade in pots and pans, and you shall stand in the market and sell them. Alas, sighed she, if any of my father's court should pass by and see me standing in the market, how they will laugh at me. But her husband did not care for that, and said she must work if she did not. Wish to die of hunger. At first the trade went well, for many people, seeing such a beautiful woman, went to buy her wares, and paid their money without thinking of taking away the goods. They lived on this as long as it lasted, and then her husband bought a fresh lot of ware, and she sat herself down with it in the corner of the market. But a drunken soldier soon came by, and rode his horse against her stall, and broke all her goods into a thousand pieces. Then she began to cry, and knew not what to do. Ah, what will become of me, said she, what will my husband say? So she ran home and told him all. Who would have thought you would have been so silly, said he, as to put an earthenware stall in the corner of the market, where everybody passes. But let us have no more crying. I see you are not fit for this sort of work, so I have been to the king's palace, and asked if they did not want a kitchen maid, and they say they will take you, and there you will have plenty to eat. Thus the princess became a kitchen maid, and helped the cook to do all the dirtiest work, but she was allowed to carry home some of the meat that was left, and on this they lived. She had not been there long before she heard that the king's eldest son was passing by, going to be married, and she went to one of the windows and looked out. Everything was ready, and all the pomp and brightness of the court was there. Then she bitterly grieved for the pride and folly which had brought her so low. And the servants gave her some of the rich meats, which she put into her basket to take home. All on a sudden, as she was going out, in came the king's son in golden clothes, and when he saw a beautiful woman at the door, he took her by the hand, and said she should be his partner in the dance. But she trembled for fear, for she saw that it was King Grizzly Beard, who was making sport of her. However, he kept fast hold, and led her in, and the cover of the basket came off, so that the meats in it fell about. Then everybody laughed and jeered at her, and she was so abashed that she wished herself a thousand feet deep in the earth. She sprang to the door to run away, but on the steps King Grizzly Beard overtook her, and brought her back and said, Fear me not. I am the fiddler who has lived with you in the hut. I brought you there because I really loved you. I am also the soldier that overset your stall. I have done all this only to cure you of your silly pride, and to show you the folly of your ill-treatment of me. Now all is over, you have learned wisdom, and it is time to hold our marriage feast. Then the chamberlains came and brought her the most beautiful robes, and her father and his whole court were there already, and welcomed her home on her marriage. Joy was in every face and every heart. The feast was grand, they danced and sang, all were merry and I only wish that you and I had been of the party. The End The Wedding of Mrs. Fox First story there was once upon a time an old fox with nine tails, who believed that his wife was not faithful to him, and wished to put her to the test. He stretched himself out under the bench, did not move a limb, and behaved as if he were stone dead. Mrs. Fox went up to her room, shut herself in, and her maid, Miss Cat, sat by the fire, and did the cooking. When it became known that the old fox was dead, suitors presented themselves. The maid heard someone standing at the house door, knocking. She went and opened it, and it was a young fox, who said, What may you be about, Miss Cat? Do you sleep or do you wake? She answered, I am not sleeping, I am waking. Would you know what I am making? I am boiling warm beer with butter. Will you be my guest for supper? No, thank you, miss, said the fox. What is Mrs. Fox doing? The maid replied, She is sitting in her room, moaning in her gloom, weeping her little eyes quite red, because old Mr. Fox is dead. Do just tell her, miss, that a young fox is here, who would like to woo her. Certainly, young sir. The cat goes up the stairs trip, trap, the door she knocks at tap, 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 Mistress Fox, are you inside? Oh, yes, my little cat, she cried. 
A wooer he stands at the door out there. What does he look like, my dear? Has he nine as beautiful tails as the late Mr. Fox? Oh, no, answered the cat. He has only one. Then I will not have him. Miss Cat went downstairs and sent the wooer away. Soon afterwards there was another knock, and another fox was at the door who wished to woo Mrs. Fox. He had two tails, but he did not fare better than the first. After this still more came, each with one tail more than the other, but they were all turned away, until at last one came who had nine tails, like old Mr. Fox. When the widow heard that, she said joyfully to the cat, Now open the gates and doors all wide, and carry old Mr. Fox outside. But just as the wedding was going to be solemnized, old Mr. Fox stirred under the bench, and cudgeled all the rabble, and drove them and Mrs. Fox out of the house. Second story when old Mr. Fox was dead, the wolf came as a suitor, and knocked at the door, and the cat who was servant to Mrs. Fox, opened it for him. The wolf greeted her, and said, Good day, Mrs. Cat of Carewit, how comes it that alone you sit? What are you making good? The cat replied, In milk I'm breaking bread so sweet, will you be my guest and eat? No, thank you, Mrs. Cat, answered the wolf. Is Mrs. Fox not at home? The cat said, she sits upstairs in her room, bewailing her sorrowful doom, bewailing her trouble so sore, for old Mr. Fox is no more. The wolf answered, If she's in want of a husband now, then will it please her to step below? The cat runs quickly up the stair, and lets her tail fly here and there, until she comes to the parlor door. With her five gold rings at the door she knocks, Are you within, good Mistress Fox? If you're in want of a husband now, then will it please you to step below? Mrs. Fox asked, Has the gentleman red stockings on, and has he a pointed mouth? No, answered the cat. Then he won't do for me. When the wolf was gone, came a dog, a stag, a hare, a bear, a lion, and all the beasts of the forest, one after the other. But one of the good qualities which old Mr. Fox had possessed was always lacking, and the cat had continually to send the suitors away. At length came a young fox. Then Mrs. Fox said, Has the gentleman red stockings on, and has a little pointed mouth? Yes, said the cat, he has. Then let him come upstairs, said Mrs. Fox, and ordered the servant to prepare the wedding feast. Sweep me the room as clean as you can, up with the window, fling out my old man. For many a fine fat mouse he brought, yet of his wife he never thought, but ate up every one he caught. Then the wedding was solemnized with young Mr. Fox, and there was much rejoicing and dancing, and if they have not left off, they are dancing still. The End The Salad As a merry young huntsman was once going briskly along through a wood, there came up a little old woman, and said to him, Good day, good day, you seem merry enough, but I am hungry and thirsty, do pray give me something to eat. The huntsman took pity on her and put his hand in his pocket, and gave her what he had. Then he wanted to go his way, but she took hold of him, and said, Listen, my friend, to what I am going to tell you. I will reward you for your kindness. Go your way, and after a little time you will come to a tree where you will see nine birds sitting on a cloak. Shoot into the midst of them, and one will fall down dead. The cloak will fall too. Take it, it is a wishing cloak and when you wear it you will find yourself at any place where you may wish to be. Cut open the dead bird, take out its heart, and keep it, and you will find a piece of gold under your pillow every morning when you rise. It is the bird's heart that will bring you this good luck. The huntsman thanked her, and thought to himself, If all this does happen, it will be a fine thing for me. When he had gone a hundred steps or so, he heard a screaming and chirping in the branches over him and looked up and saw a flock of birds pulling a cloak with their bills and feet, screaming, fighting, and tugging at each other, as if each wished to have it himself. Well, said the huntsman, this is wonderful. This happens just as the old woman said. Then he shot into the midst of them so that their feathers flew all about. Off went the flock chattering away, but one fell down dead, and the cloak with it. Then the huntsman did as the old woman told him, cut open the bird, took out the heart and carried the cloak home with him. The next morning when he awoke he lifted up his pillow, 
and there lay the piece of gold glittering underneath. The same happened next day, and indeed every day when he arose. He heaped up a great deal of gold, and at last thought to himself, Of what use is this gold to me whilst I am at home? I will go out into the world and look about me. Then he took leave of his friends, and hung his bag and bow about his neck, and went his way. It so happened that his road one day led through a thick wood, at the end of which was a large castle in a green meadow, and at one of the windows stood an old woman with a very beautiful young lady by her side looking about them. Now the old woman was a witch, and said to the young lady, There is a young man coming out of the wood who carries a wonderful prize. We must get it away from him, my dear child, for it is more fit for us than for him. He has a bird's heart that brings a piece of gold under his pillow every morning. Meantime the huntsman came nearer and looked at the lady, and said to himself, I have been travelling so long that I should like to go into this castle and rest myself, for I have money enough to pay for anything I want. But the real reason was, that he wanted to see more of the beautiful lady. Then he went into the house, and was welcomed kindly, and it was not long before he was so much in love that he thought of nothing else but looking at the lady's eyes and doing everything that she wished. Then the old woman said, Now is the time for getting the bird's heart. So the lady stole it away, and he never found any more gold under his pillow, for it lay now under the young ladies, and the old woman took it away every morning, but he was so much in love that he never missed his prize. Well, said the old witch, we have got the bird's heart, but not the wishing cloak yet, and that we must also get. Let us leave him that, said the young lady. He has already lost his wealth. Then the witch was very angry, and said, Such a cloak is a very rare and wonderful thing, and I must and will have it. So she did as the old woman told her, and set herself at the window, and looked about the country and seemed very sorrowful. Then the huntsman said, What makes you so sad? Alas! Dear sir, said she, Yonder lies the granite rock where all the costly diamonds grow and I want so much to go there, that whenever I think of it I cannot help being sorrowful, for who can reach it? Only the birds and the flies man cannot. If that's all your grief, said the huntsman, I'll take you there with all my heart. So he drew her under his cloak, and the moment he wished to be on the granite mountain they were both there. The diamonds glittered so on all sides that they were delighted with the sight and picked up the finest. But the old witch made a deep sleep come upon him, and he said to the young lady, Let us sit down and rest ourselves a little. I am so tired that I cannot stand any longer. So they sat down, and he laid his head in her lap and fell asleep. And whilst he was sleeping on she took the cloak from his shoulders, hung it on her own, picked up the diamonds, and wished herself home again. When he awoke and found that his lady had tricked him, and left him alone on the wild rock, he said, Alas! What roguery there is in the world, and there he sat in great grief and fear, not knowing what to do. Now this rock belonged to fierce giants who lived upon it, and as he saw three of them striding about, he thought to himself, I can only save myself by feigning to be asleep. So he laid himself down as if he were in a sound sleep. When the giants came up to him, the first pushed him with his foot, and said, What worm is this that lies here curled up? Tread upon him and kill him, said the second. It's not worth the trouble, said the third. Let him live, he'll go climbing higher up the mountain, and some cloud will come rolling and carry him away. And they passed on. But the huntsman had heard all they said, and as soon as they were gone, he climbed to the top of the mountain, and when he had sat there a short time a cloud came rolling around him, and caught him in a whirlwind and bore him along for some time, till it settled in a garden and he fell quite gently to the ground amongst the greens and cabbages. Then he looked around him, and said, I wish I had something to eat, if not I shall be worse off than before, for here I see either apples nor pears, nor any kind of fruits, nothing but vegetables. At last he thought to himself, I can eat salad, it will refresh and strengthen me. So he picked out a fine head and ate of it, but scarcely had he swallowed two bites when he felt himself quite changed, and saw with horror that he was turned into an ass. However, he still felt very hungry, and the salad tasted very nice, so he ate until he came to another kind of salad, 
and scarcely had he tasted it when he felt another change come over him, and soon saw that he was lucky enough to have found his old shape again. Then he laid himself down and slept off a little of his weariness, and when he awoke the next morning he broke off ahead both of the good and the bad salad, and thought to himself, This will help me to my fortune again, and enable me to pay off some folks for their treachery. So he went away to try and find the castle of his friends, and after wandering about a few days he luckily found it. Then he stained his face all over brown, so that even his mother would not have known him, and went into the castle and asked for a lodging. I am so tired, said he, that I can go no farther. Countryman, said the witch, who are you? And what is your business? I am, said he, a messenger sent by the king to find the finest salad that grows under the sun. I have been lucky enough to find it, and have brought it with me. But the heat of the sun scorches so that it begins to wither, and I don't know that I can carry it farther. When the witch and the young lady heard of his beautiful salad, they longed to taste it, and said, Dear countrymen, let us just taste it. To be sure, answered he, I have two heads of it with me, and will give you one. So he opened his bag and gave them the bad. Then the witch herself took it into the kitchen to be dressed, and when it was ready she could not wait till it was carried up, but took a few leaves immediately, and put them in her mouth and scarcely were they swallowed when she lost her own form and ran braying down into the court in the form of an ass. Now the servant-maid came into the kitchen, and seeing the salad ready, was going to carry it up, but on the way she too felt a wish to taste it as the old woman had done, and ate some leaves, so she also was turned into an ass and ran after the other, letting the dish with the salad fall on the ground. The messenger sat all this time with the beautiful young lady, and as nobody came with the salad and she longed to taste it, she said, I don't know where the salad can be. Then he thought something must have happened, and said, I will go into the kitchen and see. And as he went he saw two asses in the court running about, and the salad lying on the ground. All right, said he, those two have had their share. Then he took up the rest of the leaves, laid them on the dish, and brought them to the young lady, saying, I bring you the dish myself that you may not wait any longer. So she ate of it, and like the others ran off into the court braying away. Then the huntsman washed his face and went into the court that they might know him. Now you shall be paid for your roguery, said he, and tied them all three to a rope and took them along with him till he came to a mill and knocked at the window. What's the matter? said the miller. I have three tiresome beasts here, said the other. If you will take them, Give them food and room, and treat them as I tell you, I will pay you whatever you ask. With all my heart, said the miller, but how shall I treat them? Then the huntsman said, Give the old one stripes three times a day and hay once. Give the next, who is the servant maid, stripes once a day and hay three times. And give the youngest, who is the beautiful lady, hay three times a day and no stripes, for he could not find it in his heart to have her beaten. After this he went back to the castle, where he found everything he wanted. Some days after, the miller came to him and told him that the old ass was dead. The other two, said he, are alive and eat, but are so sorrowful that they cannot last long. Then the huntsman pitied them, and told the miller to drive them back to him, and when they came, he gave them some of the good salad to eat. And the beautiful young lady fell upon her knees before him, and said, O oh, dearest huntsman! Forgive me all the ill I have done you. My mother forced me to it. It was against my will, for I always loved you very much. Your wishing cloak hangs up in the closet, and as for the bird's heart, I will give it you too. But he said, Keep it, it will be just the same thing, for I mean to make you my wife. So they were married, and lived together very happily till they died. The End The Story of the Youth Who Went Forth to Learn What Fear Was a certain father had two sons, the elder of who was smart and sensible, and could do everything, but the younger was stupid and could neither learn nor understand anything, and when people saw him they said, there's a fellow who will give his father some trouble. When anything had to be done, it was always the elder who was forced to do it, but if his father bade him fetch anything when it was late, or in the night time, and the way led through the churchyard, or any other dismal place, he answered, Oh, no, father, 
I'll not go there, it makes me shudder, for he was afraid. Or when stories were told by the fire at night which made the flesh creep, the listeners sometimes said, oh, it makes us shudder. The younger sat in a corner and listened with the rest of them, and could not imagine what they could mean. They are always saying, it makes me shudder, it makes me shudder. It does not make me shudder, thought he. That, too, must be an art of which I understand nothing. Now it came to pass that his father said to him one day, Hearken to me, you fellow in the corner there, you are growing tall and strong, and you too must learn something by which you can earn your bread. Look how your brother works, but you do not even earn your salt. Well, father, he replied, I am quite willing to learn something. Indeed, if it could but be managed, I should like to learn how to shudder. I don't understand that at all yet. The elder brother smiled when he heard that and thought to himself, Goodness, what a blockhead that brother of mine is. He will never be good for anything as long as he lives. He who wants to be a sickle must bend himself betimes. The father sighed and answered him, You shall soon learn what it is to shudder, but you will not earn your bread by that. Soon after this the sexton came to the house on a visit, and the father bewailed his trouble and told him how his younger son was so backward in every respect that he knew nothing and learned nothing. Just think, said he, when I asked him how he was going to earn his bread, he actually wanted to learn to shudder. If that be all, replied the sexton, he can learn that with me. Send him to me, and I will soon polish him. The father was glad to do it, for he thought, it will train the boy a little. The sexton therefore took him into his house, and he had to ring the church bell. After a day or two, the sexton awoke him at midnight and bade him arise and go up into the church tower and ring the bell. You shall soon learn what shuddering is, thought he, and secretly went there before him. And when the boy was at the top of the tower and turned round, and was just going to take hold of the bell rope, he saw a white figure standing on the stairs opposite the sounding hole. Who is there? cried he, but the figure made no reply and did not move or stir. Give an answer, cried the boy, or take yourself off, you have no business here at night. The sexton, however, remained standing motionless that the boy might think he was a ghost. The boy cried a second time, What do you want here? Speak if you are an honest fellow, or I will throw you down the steps. The sexton thought, He can't mean to be as bad as his words, uttered no sound and stood as if he were made of stone. Then the boy called to him for the third time, and as that was also to no purpose, he ran against him and pushed the ghost down the stairs, so that it fell down the ten steps and remained lying there in a corner. Thereupon he rang the bell, went home, and without saying a word went to bed, and fell asleep. The sexton's wife waited a long time for her husband, but he did not come back. At length she became uneasy, and wakened the boy, and asked, Do you know where my husband is? He climbed up the tower before you did. No, I don't know, replied the boy, but someone was standing by the sounding hole on the other side of the steps, and as he would neither give an answer nor go away, I took him for a scoundrel and threw him downstairs. Just go there, and you will see if it was he. I should be sorry if it were. The woman ran away and found her husband, who was lying moaning in the corner and had broken his leg. She carried him down and then with loud screams she hastened to the boy's father, your boy, cried she, has been the cause of a great misfortune. He has thrown my husband down the steps so that he broke his leg. Take the good-for-nothing fellow out of our house. The father was terrified, and ran thither and scolded the boy. What wicked tricks are these, said he. The devil must have put them into your head. Father, he replied, do listen to me. I am quite innocent. He was standing there by night like one intent on doing evil. I did not know who it was, and I entreated him three times either to speak or to go away. Ah, said the father, I have nothing but unhappiness with you. Go out of my sight. I will see you no more. Yes, father, write willingly, wait only until it is day. Then will I go forth and learn how to shudder, and then I shall, at any rate, understand one art which will support me. Learn what you will, spoke the father, it is all the same to me. Here are fifty dollars for you. 
Take these and go into the wide world, and tell no one from whence you come, and who is your father, for I have reason to be ashamed of you. Yes, father, it shall be as you will. If you desire nothing more than that, I can easily keep it in mind. When the day dawned, therefore, the boy put his fifty dollars into his pocket, and went forth on the great highway, and continually said to himself, If I could but shudder! If I could but shudder! Then a man approached who heard this conversation which the youth was holding with himself, and when they had walked a little farther to where they could see the gallows, the man said to him, Look, there is the tree where seven men have married the rope-maker's daughter, and are now learning how to fly. Sit down beneath it, and wait till night comes, and you will soon learn how to shudder. If that is all that is wanted, answered the youth, it is easily done. But if I learn how to shudder as fast as that, you shall have my fifty dollars. Just come back to me early in the morning. Then the youth went to the gallows, sat down beneath it, and waited till evening came. And as he was cold, he lighted himself a fire. But at midnight the wind blew so sharply that in spite of his fire, he could not get warm. And as the wind knocked the hanged men against each other, and they moved backwards and forwards, he thought to himself, If you shiver below by the fire, how those up above must freeze and suffer. And as he felt pity for them, he raised the ladder, and climbed up, unbound one of them after the other, and brought down all seven. Then he stoked the fire, blew it, and set them all round it to warm themselves. But they sat there and did not stir, and the fire caught their clothes. So he said, Take care, or I will hang you up again. The dead men, however, did not hear, but were quite silent, and let their rags go on burning. At this he grew angry, and said, If you will not take care, I cannot help you, I will not be burnt with you, and he hung them up again each in his turn. Then he sat down by his fire and fell asleep, and the next morning the man came to him and wanted to have the fifty dollars, and said, Well, do you know how to shudder? No, answered he, how should I know? Those fellows up there did not open their mouths, and were so stupid that they let the few old rags which they had on their bodies get burnt. Then the man saw that he would not get the fifty dollars that day, and went away saying, Such a youth has never come my way before. The youth likewise went his way, and once more began to mutter to himself, Ah, if I could but shudder! Ah, if I could but shudder! A wagoner who was striding behind him heard this and asked, Who are you? I don't know, answered the youth. Then the wagoner asked, From whence do you come? I know not. Who is your father? That I may not tell you. What is it that you are always muttering between your teeth? Ah, replied the youth, I do so wish I could shudder, but no one can teach me how. Enough of your foolish chatter, said the wagoner. Come, go with me. I will see about a place for you. The youth went with the wagoner, and in the evening they arrived at an inn where they wished to pass the night. Then at the entrance of the parlor the youth again said quite loudly, If I could but shudder! If I could but shudder! The host who heard this, laughed and said, If that is your desire, there ought to be a good opportunity for you here. Ah, uh, be silent, said the hostess. So many prying persons have already lost their lives. It would be a pity and a shame if such beautiful eyes as these should never see the daylight again. But the youth said, However difficult it may be, I will learn it. For this purpose indeed have I journeyed forth. He let the host have no rest, until the latter told him that not far from thence stood a haunted castle where any one could very easily learn what shuddering was, if he would but watch in it for three nights. The king had promised that he who would venture should have his daughter to wife and she was the most beautiful maiden the sun shone on. Likewise in the castle lay great treasures, which were guarded by evil spirits, and these treasures would then be freed, and would make a poor man rich enough. Already many men had gone into the castle, but as yet none had come out again. Then the youth went next morning to the king, and said, If it be allowed, I will willingly watch three nights in the haunted castle. The king looked at him, and as the youth pleased him, he said, you may ask for three things to take into the castle with you, but they must be things without life. Then he answered, Then I ask for a fire, a turning lathe, and a cutting board with the knife. The king had these things carried into the castle for him during the day. 
When night was drawing near, the youth went up and made himself a bright fire in one of the rooms, placed the cutting board and knife beside it, and seated himself by the turning lathe. Ah, if I could but shudder, said he, but I shall not learn it here either. Towards midnight he was about to poke his fire, and as he was blowing it, something cried suddenly from one corner, Oh, meow! How cold we are! You fools, cried he, what are you crying about? If you are cold, come and take a seat by the fire and warm yourselves. And when he had said that, two great black cats came with one tremendous leap and sat down on each side of him and looked savagely at him with their fiery eyes. After a short time, when they had warmed themselves, they said, Comrade, shall we have a game of cards? Why not, he replied, but just show me your paws. Then they stretched out their claws. Oh, said he, what long nails you have. Wait, I must first cut them for you. Thereupon he seized them by the throats, put them on the cutting board and screwed their feet fast. I have looked at your fingers, said he, and my fancy for card playing has gone, and he struck them dead and threw them out into the water. But when he had made away with these two, and was about to sit down again by his fire, out from every hole and corner came black cats and black dogs with red-hot chains, and more and more of them came until he could no longer move, and they yelled horribly, and got on his fire, pulled it to pieces, and tried to put it out. He watched them for a while quietly. But at last, when they were going too far, he seized his cutting knife, and cried, Away with you, vermin, and began to cut them down. Some of them ran away, the others he killed, and threw out into the fish pond. When he came back he fanned the embers of his fire again, and warmed himself. And as he thus sat, his eyes would keep open no longer, and he felt a desire to sleep. Then he looked round and saw a great bed in the corner. That is the very thing for me, said he, and got into it. When he was just going to shut his eyes, however, the bed began to move of its own accord, and went over the whole of the castle. That's right, said he, but go faster. Then the bed rolled on as if six horses were harnessed to it, up and down, over thresholds and stairs, but suddenly hop, hop, it turned over upside down, and lay on him like a mountain. But he threw quilts and pillows up in the air, got out and said, now anyone who likes may drive, and lay down by his fire, and slept till it was day. In the morning the king came, and when he saw him lying there on the ground, he thought the evil spirits had killed him, and he was dead. Then said he, After all it is a pity, for so handsome a man. The youth heard it, got up, and said, It has not come to that yet. Then the king was astonished, but very glad, and asked how he had fared. Very well indeed, answered he, one night is past, the two others will pass likewise. Then he went to the innkeeper, who opened his eyes very wide, and said, I never expected to see you alive again. Have you learned how to shudder yet? No, said he, it is all in vain. If someone would but tell me. The second night he again went up into the old castle, sat down by the fire, and once more began his old song, If I could but shudder. When midnight came, an uproar and noise of tumbling about was heard. At first it was low, but it grew louder and louder. Then it was quiet for a while, and at length with a loud scream, half a man came down the chimney and fell before him. Hello, cried he, another half belongs to this. This is not enough. Then the uproar began again, there was a roaring and howling, and the other half fell down likewise. Wait, said he. I will just stoke up the fire a little for you. When he had done that and looked round again, the two pieces were joined together, and a hideous man was sitting in his place. That is no part of our bargain, said the youth, the bench is mine. The man wanted to push him away. The youth, however, would not allow that, but thrust him off with all his strength, and seated himself again in his own place. Then still more men fell down, one after the other. They brought nine dead men's legs and two skulls, and set them up and played at nine pins with them. The youth also wanted to play and said, Listen you, can I join you? Yes, if you have any money. Money enough, replied he, but your balls are not quite round. Then he took the skulls and put them in the lathe and turned them till they were round. There, now they will roll better, said he. Hurrah! Now we'll have fun! 
He played with them and lost some of his money, but when it struck twelve, everything vanished from his sight. He laid down and quietly fell asleep. Next morning the king came to inquire after him. How has it fared with you this time? asked he. I have been playing at nine pins, he answered, and have lost a couple of farthings. Have you not shuddered then? What, said he, I have had a wonderful time. If I did but know what it was to shudder. The third night he sat down again on his bench and said quite sadly, If I could but shudder. When it grew late, six tall men came in and brought a coffin. Then he said, Ha, ha, that is certainly my little cousin, who died only a few days ago, and he beckoned with his finger, and cried, Come, little cousin, come. They placed the coffin on the ground, but he went to it and took the lid off, and a dead man lay therein. He felt his face, but it was cold as ice. Wait, said he, I will warm you a little, and went to the fire and warmed his hand and laid it on the dead man's face, but he remained cold. Then he took him out, and sat down by the fire and laid him on his breast and rubbed his arms that the blood might circulate again. As this also did no good, he thought to himself, when two people lie in bed together, they warm each other, and carried him to the bed, covered him over and lay down by him. After a short time the dead man became warm too, and began to move. Then said the youth, See, little cousin, have I not warmed you? The dead man, however, got up and cried, Now will I strangle you. What, said he, is that the way you thank me? You shall at once go into your coffin again. And he took him up, threw him into it, and shut the lid. Then came the six men, and carried him away again. I cannot manage to shudder, said he. I shall never learn it here as long as I live. Then a man entered who was taller than all others, and looked terrible. He was old, however, and had a long white beard. You wretch, cried he, you shall soon learn what it is to shudder, for you shall die. Not so fast, replied the youth. If I am to die, I shall have to have a say in it. I will soon seize you, said the fiend. Softly, softly, do not talk so big. I am as strong as you are, and perhaps even stronger. We shall see, said the old man. If you are stronger, I will let you go. Come, we will try. Then he led him by dark passages to a smith's forge, took an axe, and with one blow struck an anvil into the ground. I can do better than that, said the youth, and went to the other anvil. The old man placed himself near and wanted to look on, and his white beard hung down. Then the youth seized the axe, split the anvil with one blow, and in it caught the old man's beard. Now I have you, said the youth. Now it is your turn to die. Then he seized an iron bar and beat the old man till he moaned and entreated him to stop, when he would give him great riches. The youth drew out the axe and let him go. The old man led him back into the castle, and in a cellar showed him three chests full of gold. Of these, said he, one part is for the poor, the other for the king, the third yours. In the meantime it struck twelve, and the spirit disappeared, so that the youth stood in darkness. I shall still be able to find my way out, said he, and felt about, found the way into the room, and slept there by his fire. Next morning the king came and said, Now you must have learnt what shuddering is? No, he answered, what can it be? My dead cousin was here, and a bearded man came and showed me a great deal of money down below, but no one told me what it was to shudder. Then, said the king, you have saved the castle, and shall marry my daughter. That is all very well, said he, but still I do not know what it is to shudder. Then the gold was brought up and the wedding celebrated. But howsoever much the young king loved his wife, and however happy he was, he still said always, If I could but shudder, if I could but shudder. And this at last angered her. Her waiting maid said, I will find a cure for him. He shall soon learn what it is to shudder. She went out to the stream which flowed through the garden and had a whole bucket full of gudgeons brought to her. At night when the young king was sleeping, his wife was to draw the clothes off him and empty the bucket full of cold water with the gudgeons in it over him, so that the little fishes would sprawl about him. Then he woke up and cried, Oh, what makes me shudder so, what makes me shudder so, dear wife? Ah, now I know what it is to shudder. 
The End And there you have it, folks. We've reached the end of this incredible story together, but the adventure doesn't stop here. We have a variety of story videos like this one available for your enjoyment. To watch more, just click here. If you've enjoyed this story and want more mind-blowing stories, be sure to smash that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss out on our next epic upload. Trust me, you won't want to miss what's coming next.